three times in the Torah, we find the word Hashavi, the seventh, with only one Yud. And the question is, why does the word Hashavi only have one Yud instead of two Yuds? The mystery of the missing Yud. The first time the word Hashavi is missing a Yud is in this week's Torah portion. The Torah tells us, the Torah talks about the mitzvah of matzah. And it says that during the holiday of Pesach, a person should eat matzah for seven days. However, one is not allowed to eat chametz, levin, for seven days. And if anyone eats chametz, they're cut off from the Jewish people. And this is true from the first day of the holiday until the seventh day of the holiday. And the word Hashavi, the seventh, is missing the first Yud. The second time, the Torah talks about the missing Yud is pertaining to the concept of the manna. That every day for 40 years, when the Jewish people were in the desert, manna came down from heaven. Lechem min and the manna would come down Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. However, on Shabbos, it did not come down. On the contrary, Friday, you had a double portion of manna. That was for Friday and Shabbos. And here, too, the Torah says that on the seventh day, the Jewish people rested. So the people rested on the seventh day. Here, too, the word Shavi is missing the letter Yud. And then the third time the word Shavi is missing the letter Yud is pertaining to the Jubilee year. And that is every 50 years in Israel, there was something that was called Yovel, the year of freedom, when the land went back to its owner. And the Torah tells us there that in the seventh month of the year, which is the month of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the High Holy Days. On the tenth day of that month, you shall blow the shofar. In other words, in addition to the blowing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, when it came to the Jubilee year, you also blew the shofar on the tenth day of the month, which is Yom Kippur. And there it says, V'havarta shofar terua b'chodesh ha-shavii b'esel chodesh You shall blow the shofar in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month. And here too, the word Hashavi is missing the first Yud. So the question is, why does the word Shavi lack this letter Yud? The Bala Turim, a famous commentator on the Torah, tells us that when you have the word Shavi without the letter Yud, it spells sovea, which means to satiate. But what does that really mean? What does it mean that the word shavi without a Yud means to satiate? Sovea. And I believe that we can answer this with the following the Gemara. The Gemara tells us in the Tractate of Nida, page 30, side B. And similarly, this is the opening of the Tanya Kadisha of the Alter Rebbe. Chapter 1, and there it says that before a child is born, right before the soul leaves the body of the mother and now comes out in this baby, and the baby becomes alive at birth, at that time the soul takes an oath. The angel that is in the womb together with the child for those nine months and teaching the soul Torah for those nine months, right before the soul and body leaves the womb of its mother, the angel makes the neshama, the soul, take an oath. And the oath is, Tehit Sadik Vialti Rasha. Mashbi and Oisai, they make the soul swear it should be a Tzadik. However, it should not be a Russia. This is the, the concept that the Gemara talks about. In general, 
We find in Chassidus, it explains that, in essence, the soul does not want to come down to the world. The soul is in a very bright, illuminated, warm place. It's basking in the knowledge of God. It's very, very happy in heaven. And now it is told that it has a journey to go down to the physical world, to go to a dark, cold place, and the soul doesn't want to go. And we try to convince the soul and, and tell the soul, you know, by going down into the body, you read the Tzedek Chaliyah. Every descent is for a greater ascent. And by the fact that the soul is in the body, and the soul will do mitzvahs, and study Torah, and give tzedakah, and follow the laws of Torah, the soul will now ascend to a much higher level. And furthermore, we tell the soul that in the body itself, they're able to acquire a much higher level. Because the body, according to Chassidus, comes from the level of Atzmus, the essence of God, and that's why the body feels its independence. And by the soul going into the body, it's going to ultimately reach that level of independence, which means that it will become one with God. So in order for the soul not to forget its obligation, its mission down here in this world, says the Gemara, Gemara, the soul takes an oath that it will be a tzaddik, it will be righteous. However, it will not be a rasha. The Tzemach Tzaddik asks, what does it mean, Majbi and Oisei, we take an oath? Who here remembers the oath of the soul? Who remembers that oath that you took right before you came into the body? Most of us do not remember the oath. So what is the purpose of the oath if we don't remember the oath? So the Tzemach Tzedek says like this, that the word mashbi in oisoy, or shavua, which means oath, also etymologically means soivea, to satiate. And similarly, it's from the word sheva, which is seven. And that in essence, all three of these things come together. And that is number one, the soul takes an oath. What is the purpose of the oath? So that the soul becomes satiated with the power and the energy to overcome all the temptations and the desires that the soul is going to encounter when the neshama, the soul, is down here in the body in the physical world. And what's the purpose of this oath? And what is the purpose of being satiated with his energy? to transform the seven, the seven unholy attributes, the seven midas ra'os of the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, and to transform these seven unholy attributes and make them holy and make them the seven attributes of the godly soul. So this concept now explains why in these three places the word Shavi is missing the Yud because these three locations are telling us the journey of the soul. And that is, we start off with the shofar blasts in the seventh month. The seventh month, which is the month of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, this is the month that every year, this time, a Jew once again renews his vows. The word for Sheva, the seventh month, is the same as Shavua. It's a month that we take upon ourselves the vow that this year we're going to be different. This year we're going to be better. This year we're going to make up for the mistakes of last year. That is the first thing we do. That's Rosh Hashanah. And we blow the shofar to remind us of this responsibility. Then comes Shabbos, which is the seventh day. What is Shabbos? Says the Zoyar, Shabbos, my name is Baruch and Kula Yoyman. Shabbos blesses the entire week. In other words, Shabbos satiates us with the energy to be able to go out into the everyday world and to bring the Shabbos together with us. One of the reasons why we make Havdallah Saturday night is to take the blessings and the inspiration and the prayers and the song of Shabbos and to bring that joy and that happiness and that peace into the rest of the week. Which explains, by the way, Halacha Rambam, the Rambam says, one is allowed to make Havdallah even before Shabbos goes out. So if Havdallah, which means separation, is to separate 
Shabbos from the weekday, how can one make Havdalah before Shabbos goes out? Now obviously you can't make Havdalah with the candles if you don't see three stars yet. But the concept of Havdalah, to read the Havdalah in the Amidah and even to do it over wine, according to the Rambam, one is allowed to do even before the sun sets. How can you make Havdalah if Shabbos didn't go out? Because the purpose of Avdallah is a bridge between Shabbos and the rest of the week, is to take the inspiration. That soiveya, that Shabbos satiates every Jew with and bring that holiness into the rest of the week. That is the second meaning of Shavua. And finally, we have the third meaning, and that is to transform the seven is the seven unholy attributes, and we make these seven attributes of kindness and severity and beauty and mercy and victory and praise and bonding and kingship, we use that, all of these attributes to serve God. And this is expressed by the fact that we say for seven days we don't eat chametz. Chametz is leaven. The Zohar says Chavetz represents the uh, Yetzahara, the evil inclination, the Satan. Because so the, the Satan is very arrogant, it wants to rebel against God. So for seven days we refrain from eating Chavetz, from this arrogance. And what do we do these seven days? We eat Matzah. And by doing so we are transforming these seven Midas Rois, these seven negative attributes of the Yetzahara, and now we transform it with the oath and with the fact that we are satiated with godly power to transform the chametz into matzah to become humble. And once one is humble before God, he has the ability to truly serve God properly. So that is why we have the yud missing in all of these three places. Because it tells us the journey of the soul. And in truth, the Yud looks like the soul. Because we are told, King Solomon says, Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam. The candle of God is the soul of man. In other words, if you look at a flame of a candle, how it flickers and it yearns to go higher and higher, in essence, that is the soul of every human being always ascending higher and yearning to connect with God. And the, the flame looks like the letter Yud. And this also hints to the fact that on the Shabbos, that we read this portion, the portion of Boy, that we read the word Hashavi'i, it was in 1940 that the previous Babach Rebbe came to America. And in 1950, 10 years later, on the Shabbos of Parsha Boy, the seventh day of the week, the soul of the previous Abba Rebbe, Rabbi Yisrael was nostalgic and ascended on high. And therefore, when you look at the word Ashvi, you see that the soul, the Yud, is missing because the Tzaddik ascended on high. The previous Rebbe, before he passed away, for a year before he passed away, he began to change his signature. He wrote his name Yosef, Joseph, and then the second word was Yitzchak for, for his second name. He used to write the letter Yud with a little Yud, the way we write the Yud in a script, a little line. About a year before he passed away, he began to write the Yud like the letter Yud in the Sefer Torah. He expounded on the Yud and expanded the Yud. And he made the Yud like a box. If you look on a Sefer Torah or Tfilin or Mezuzis, the way a Sofer writes a Yud, the Yud has dimension to it. And the Rebbe said that the reason why his father-in-law, the sixth Rebbe, did this was to hint to the fact that the Yud, which is the gematria of 10, is the day that he would pass away, the 10th day of the month of Shvat. And he knew the day he was going to pass away. He knew it would be the 10th of the month of Shvat. And so he made the letter Yud big to imply the 10th day of Shvat. 
Before he passed away, he wrote four Hasidic discourses, which was one long hemshich, one long mimer, that, that was made up of 20 chapters. And he divided it up into four different dates. And he said, you should learn this on different dates. The first set of five chapters he gave to his secretary and said, make sure you give this out on the 10th day of the month of Shvat. This was the day he passed away. And the Rebbe said that this was the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe's last will and testament to his Hasidim and to this generation. And the Mimer begins with Basi Lagani Achesikalo. The Mimer begins with I come to my garden, my sister, my bride. And the Mimer goes on to say that in truth the world when it was created was a garden. It was a place of pleasure, a place of delight. And the Iker Shechina, God's main presence was down here in this world. What happened was there were seven major sins and these sins removed the divine presence from the world. And the Medrash goes on to say the seven sins. The first sin was the Chet Eitz Hadas, the sin of the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit. So what happened was at that time the, Ish, the Iker Shechina, the main presence of God, the Shechina, left this world and went up to the first heaven. Then it goes on to say the second sin was Cain. When Cain killed his brother Hevel, Cain and Abel. The, the Shechina now went from the first heaven to the second heaven. And then through the sin of Enoish who started idolatry, it went to the third heaven. And through the generation of the Mabel and the flood, it went to the fourth heaven. And then there was a generation of the Dara Flaga who built the tower of Babel or Babylon and the Shechina went to the fifth level, to the fifth heaven. And then you had the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the Shechina went to the sixth heaven. And then you had the Egyptians who were corrupted in the time of Abraham. And the Shechina, the divine presence, went to the seventh heaven. Came along Abraham, and he began to make God known in the world. He spread monotheism in a world that was filled with polytheism. And he began to prove that there's truly only one God. Avram Avinu took this Shekhinah, took the Divine Presence from the seventh heaven and brought it down to the sixth. And then Yitzchak brought it down another level, and Yaakov another level, and Levi his son another level, and Kahaz his son another level. Amram, the father of Moshe, brought it down to the sixth level. And finally, Moshe Rabbeinu on Sinai brought it down to this seventh level back to this world. And when God came on Sinai by Matan Torah, that is when God came back to the world. But that was God's actions. That was what we call Melmaila Lulamata. It was from above to below. Then we got involved to maintain this connection by, number one, building the Holy Temple, building the Mishkan, representing the concept of his hapcha, transformation, using all of these 13 and 15 materials to create a dwelling place for God. And then we went on to Escafia, subjugation by taking karbonos, by taking animals and putting on the altar for a sacrifice. And by doing so, transforming not only the physical animal, but our own animal within ourselves and elevating these seven emotions of the animal and elevating it to God. And by doing so, God now comes down even more into the world. So this was the, the Medrish that the previous Rebbe mentioned in the Maimur. The Lubavitch Rebbe, who spoke on, on the discourse every year on the passing of his father-in-law, he would say that this concept of the parable of the Medrash, of the seven great leaders that brought down God to the world, is also a lesson for us. And that is that we are the seventh generation from the Alter Rebbe, from the first Chabad Rebbe. 
And therefore, our job as a seventh generation is to bring down the Iker Shechina, to bring down God into this world in a real way, that God manifests in this world, that the entire world can see God. As he says in the Maimer, that is Ligmar Hamshachas Hashechina to complete this travel, this journey of the Shechina down to this world. And he says that the seventh generation, the Medrash tells us, Kol all the seventh is beloved. The seventh day is Shabbos, that's beloved. And Moshe was the seventh, he was beloved. And our generation is the seventh, therefore we are beloved. And we are beloved not because we're smarter and brighter and, and, and more diligent and more successful than the other generations. The fact that you are seven automatically that makes you beloved. In other words, we didn't choose to be the seventh generation. And it wasn't because of our good looks or because of our actions or because of our success that we became the seventh generation. And even more than that, we perhaps didn't want to even be in this generation. But you know something? We were chosen. God made us a seventh generation. And because we're seventh, automatically we are loved. At the same time, we also have the ultimate responsibility and the ultimate mission. And that is to finish the job that was started by Adam and Chava. And to finish the job that was started by Avram and Sarah. And to finish the job that was, that was started by Moshe and Aaron. And to bring the Iker Shechina, the ultimate essence of the Shechina, down into the world. So this power to fulfill this mission was given to us. It was given to us on the Shabbos of Parsha Boy, when, when, when the previous Rebbe ascended on high. The word became Hashvi without the Yud, which means to satiate. It says in Tanya that when a tzaddik leaves the world, he gives strength to all those who follow him. And therefore, he gave us now this satiation, this power, to be able to fulfill our mission, being that we are the seventh generation. Therefore, this generation is the, the last generation of exile and the first generation of the ultimate redemption. We are now given this Yud, the soul of the previous Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, who passed away on the seventh day of the portion of Boi, who gives the seventh generation this mission and this oath to fulfill the purpose of creation. So we have all the energy we need. We have all the power that we need. We have all the blessing that we need. And he even enlarged the letter Yud because the Yud in general is the nature of humility and also concealment. It's a very small letter. It's the smallest of all the letters. But now that the Yud is enlarged, it becomes revealed. It says in uh, Kabbalah and Chassidus that the letter Yud alludes to the level of Keser. In other words, the, the Kreitzei Shal Yud, the top point of the Yud that points upward, this alludes to the world of Keser, the world of crown, which is a very concealed world. And now that we expand the Yud, and we put another two points onto the Yud, we bring it down to Chachman to Bina, so now we realize this potential into reality. And therefore, each one of us, if we only want Adam Kiyakir Mikem Ubechem Adavatoli, if we truly want, we have the ability to reach this level and to fulfill this purpose and to bring an end to the exile and to bring the ultimate jubilee, the ultimate year of freedom. We will hear Tekab Shefer Godel, we will hear the blowing of the great shofar which is the shofar of Mashiach from Heda Bimenu Amin.